Good day YouTube and good day world! Welcome to my channel! For those who are new, you're very much welcome! It's only 113 days before Christmas, so that's just a few months to go. For today, we're going to talk about sepsis or the body's response to an infection. But before that, I'd like to greet my family, colleagues, friends in TCG, Dickies, and colleague leagues. I hope you're all doing great today. Also, shout out to Dahlia's Flores for our succulents. You may follow them on Facebook. Their Facebook page is Dahlia's Florist. Also, shout out to Kuya George of GNJ Metro Asian Foods Limited for the plantain. You may follow his Facebook page as well. Now, let's start. Sepsis is a life-threatening condition and it's usually a result of an infection somewhere from the body such as a chest infection, a urine infection, or a wound infection. But who are the most vulnerable of developing sepsis? So who are at risk for sepsis? Number one, we've got elderly because their immune system or immune function is deteriorating with age. Number two, we've got infants or children less than one year old as their immune system isn't fully developed yet. Next, we've got pregnant women and people who've got comorbidities such as lung diseases, diabetes, liver cirrhosis, and kidney disease. And finally, we've got people who are immunocompromised, such as people who have been diagnosed with cancer. Now let's go to the diagnostics done to check and confirm sepsis. The first one is bloods. This is done primarily to check for increased leukocytes, white blood cell or WBC count, due to the infection, as well as increased C-reactive protein or CRP, which is an inflammatory marker due to the infection as well. And the third one is to check for lactate due to the lactic acid buildup to the infection process. The next one we've got urine sampling. This is just to check for any urinary tract infection or urosepsis. The third and fourth diagnostics include sputum sampling and chest x-ray. This is just to confirm if there's any ongoing chest infection. The sputum is obtained and is tested for microbial growth and sensitivity while the chest x-ray gives a clear picture of the chest condition. The next test is a wound swab just to check for any microbial growth or culture and sensitivity from a wound site if there is or any. Next we've got ultrasound which checks for gallbladder or ovarian infection. We've also got the CT scan or computerized tomography scan to check for any appendix or pancreatic infection. And lastly, we've got the MRI or the magnetic resonance imaging, which detects underlying soft tissue infections. Now we know the group of people who's got the higher risk of developing this condition. Let's find out how sepsis happens. Let's tackle the pathophysiology. Sepsis pathophysiology begins when pathogens such as bacteria, fungi, or viruses enter the bloodstream. This activates the immune system response, which involves the neutrophils, leukocytes, phagocytes, and interferons. Equally, it triggers acute inflammation, as evidenced by heat or calor, pain or dolor, redness or rubor, inflammation or tumor, and loss of function. This event results to endothelial tissue damage and cytokine production. The endothelium plays a pivotal role in the body as it regulates the vascular tone, facilitates transport of nutrient and oxygen between the intravascular and extravascular spaces, and it regulates coagulation to preserve blood flow. Let's go back to the endothelial tissue damage. This leads to increased nitric oxide production, which then leads to reduced intracellular calcium levels as well as the relaxation of the vascular smooth muscles. The end result is vasodilation, or the widening of the blood vessels. Tissue damage also increases endothelial permeability, which causes capillary leak as well as impaired or altered transport of nutrients and oxygen. The fluid shift leads to interstitial and alveolar edema, while the altered transport of oxygen and nutrients will lead to nutrient deprivation as well as cellular hypoxia. Meanwhile, endothelial damage will also lead to coagulopathies as well as impaired fibrinolysis, which then result to 
increased blood clotting. Now, the reduced vascular tone and vasodilation will result to diminished cardiac output, as well as reduced venous return and low blood pressure. As a result, hypoperfusion or reduced blood flow and oxygenation occurs, which leads to hypoxia or reduced oxygenation in the cells and tissues. Also, the excess fluid in the interstitial cells and alveoli resulting from the capillary leak alongside hypoexygenation will also result to hypoxia. Meanwhile, the blood clotting caused by the impaired fibrinolysis leads to reduced blood supply and tissue hypoperfusion, and the end result is also hypoxia. Hypoxia then affects the body's organ systems. In the lungs, Lack of oxygen results to acute lung injury and acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS or ARDS. Poor oxygenation in the heart also leads to cardiac issues such as angina or chest pain as well as myocardial infarction or cardiac issue death. If hypotension or low blood pressure is not managed, it will lead to shock, specifically septic shock since we're talking about sepsis. In the brain, cerebral hypoxia also leads to altered level of consciousness. The person may exhibit confusion and lethargy and worse, brain damage. The hypothalamus in the brain is the body's thermoregulatory center, and in sepsis, pyrexia or fever is expected due to the ongoing infection and inflammatory processes. In the kidneys, Reduced oxygenation leads to acute kidney injury, as evidenced by oliguria, or reduced urine output. This is the body's way of maintaining stability, or homeostasis. Since there's already hypotension secondary to vasodilation and capillary leaks, the body now needs to direct blood flow to major organs such as the brain, heart, and lungs, and conserve fluid as well. Next is the liver. In sepsis, the liver suffers from hepatocyte or liver cell damage, which could lead to liver failure and reduce detoxification in the body. Finally, sepsis also affects the gut or the gastrointestinal system, and this life-threatening condition could lead to the perforation of the bowels. If sepsis is not treated, these organs will be unable to carry out their normal function and this will lead to a condition called multi-organ failure, which would lead to death. Okay guys, so that's the pathophysiology of sepsis. With that on board, let's now have a look at the signs and symptoms of the condition. So guys, the following are the sepsis signs and symptoms. Let's start with airway and breathing. We've got tachypnea or increased respiratory rate, which is more than 20 cycles per minute. In addition to that, we've got labored breathing as well. This may be related to the pulmonary edema secondary to the fluid shifts from the capillary leak. On cardiovascular assessment, so we've got hypotension or low blood pressure. You'll be seeing a systolic blood pressure of less than 100 millimeter mercury, as well as tachycardia or increased heart rate, which is more than or greater than 100 beats per minute. The drop in the blood pressure is related to vasodilation, which is secondary to increased nitric oxide production and reduced vascular tone. And because the blood pressure is low, the body, particularly the heart, has to pump more blood in order to supply more blood and oxygen to the tissues and cells. Next, we've got pyrexia or fever, which is a temperature that measures equal or greater than 38.0 degrees Celsius or equal or more than 100.5 degrees Fahrenheit. While pyrexia or fever is more common in sepsis, you may also encounter hypothermia or low body temperature. The measurement is less than or equal to 36.0 degrees Celsius or less than or equal to 96.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, we've got edema related to the capillary leak as well as cold clammy skin, which is the body's way to maintain homeostasis because of the high temperature it's trying to cool itself down. The moisture it produced could be felt as this symptom. Next, we've got D, distance and dexterity. 
We've got confusion related to brain or cerebral hypoxia as well as hyperglycemia or increased blood sugar levels, which is more than 7 millimoles per liter. This is the body's response to stress like an infection such as sepsis. Moving on to exposure. So we've got edema, again, this is related to the capillary leak as well as the cold clammy skin as the body is trying to cool itself down. On to fluids. We've got oliguria or reduced urine output, which is 0.5 ml per kilogram per hour. This is related to the body's attempt to conserve fluid due to the hypotension and the capillary leak. We've also got edema. This may be pulmonary, which pertains to the lungs, as well as peripheral, which pertains to the extremities, which are the arms and the legs. G is gut or gastrointestinal, so we've got bilirubin which measures more than 4 mg per deciliter. This is related to the hepatocyte assault due to the infection. And then we've already explained hyperglycemia because the body is under stress in an infection. H or hematologically, we've got leukocytosis or increased WBC or white blood cell count measuring more than 12,000 microliters. On the other hand, it can be a reduced white blood cell count or leukopenia amounting to less than 4,000 microliters. And finally, we've got letter I or infection. We're talking about the CRP or the C-reactive protein which is an inflammatory marker which indicates infection. So the value, it varies from laboratory to laboratory, therefore we've put more than standard deviation or more than two point standard deviation. So these are the signs and symptoms of sepsis. Okay guys, now we've tackled the following. Number one, people at risk of developing sepsis. Number two, pathophysiology of sepsis. And number three, the signs and symptoms of sepsis. As I've said earlier, sepsis is a life-threatening condition. Therefore, early recognition or detection as well as early management or treatment could increase a person's chances of survival. Alright, before we end this video, I'd like to share to you this quote. So we can call this our quote for the day. Okay, so this is our quote for today. Our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try, just one more time. This is by Mr. Thomas A. Edison. Edison invented the light bulb. Without him, we wouldn't have the light bulb and the light that we've got today, especially at night. So just a background, he had had 10,000 attempts before he finally succeeded with his invention. So the lesson from this quote, never give up, never surrender that's your greatest weakness. No matter how many times you fall, learn to stand up. No matter how many times you fail, keep trying. Keep trying until you succeed. And it wouldn't hurt if you give one more shot. So Edison says, just do it one more time. And that's the surest way to achieve your goal. For now, this concludes our video for today. If you like the content of this video, feel free to click the like button and also subscribe and hit the bell icon so you wouldn't miss my future videos. Again, thank you very much for watching this video under my healthcare series and I'm happy to create more educational content for you guys. So for now, I'll see you later. Bye-bye.